Okay. We're just going to wait for you all to kind of come into the room as it were, like entering the lecture theatre. Uh, we've we've been blown away with the response to this. Got well over three hundred people registered for, for Dom's talk. Uh, Dom's knowledge about COVID is phenomenal. It's absolutely phenomenal, and he's also a mate. So I'm I'm really happy that Dom's agreed to do this for us. Uh, it will be an interactive presentation. So during it, any questions at all, just ask us. Uh, Don will try, try his best to answer some of this. We don't know the answers at the moment, but uh, we'll also make a recording of the presentation, uh, which will be available afterwards, but it'll probably take a few days to get that organized. Uh, CPD certificates, we'll give you the stuff at the end, but basically everybody who's registered and attends will get an email and then they'll get links from that to get certificates. There's no charge for any of this. We're not charging for any certificates or anything. It's all completely free. Um, I'm just I'm going to wait until we hit 200, Dom, and then we'll start. Okay. Oh, it's going to stop now. It's 188. Oh, mate. Okay, I'm going to pass you over to, to Dom. So Dominic O'Hooley, uh, he'll introduce himself. I'll say any questions during it. There's a Q&A button just at the bottom. Just ask a question and then we'll answer it either at the time or afterwards. Hello, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank you all so much for in this you know, incredibly uh, challenging time for giving up your time and coming to uh, watch this webinar with me. Um, feel really touched about that. And I hope it's worth your while. Um, so I'm trying to continue the debate today um, and trying to be quite specific about COVID-19 and how it's affecting dentistry. But I'm gonna be moving a bit around the topic as well. So I would like you to um, take the opportunity to ask me questions as we go through, as Rob has said. And I'd like to thank Rob so much for this, uh, the opportunity to do this webinar today as well. So who am I? Uh, well, I'm a, as you can see, I made a rather silly uh, decision to shave my head the other day. So uh, um, I have to endure rather unusual looks from my wife at the moment. Been a dentist for the last 27 years. At this time in my career, I'm mainly doing implants. Um, very much interested in specific aspects of implant dentistry. I haven't done much NHS dentistry at all in, in, the, in my whole dental career. A little bit right at the beginning after I left hospital dentistry. But very quickly, I realised it wasn't for me. Um, because I don't work well under the pressure of having to see a large number of patients. I'm one of these people who perhaps needs a little bit longer with each patient. Um, I live in Leeds um, at the moment. West Yorkshire is not regarded as a primary surge area for the COVID-19 disease. Um, however, South Yorkshire, particularly Sheffield, does appear to be becoming a what we call a secondary surge area. Um, I'm a very lucky chap. I'm married to a beautiful lady called Rebecca and we've got five gorgeous kids as well. So I've just a bit of a disclaimer. I've got no financial links whatsoever to, to Rob's company, Pro Dental CPD. I am only a general dentist, you know, and I'm providing this webinar really to try and stimulate more debate on this subject. Um, and as we go through the webinar, hopefully I think you'll understand the areas I'm trying to get that debate going. Uh, I'm not trying to be super confrontational or really controversial. However, I do know that my nature tends to lead to those kind of things. So if it happens, it happens. I think it's really important. It's your own responsibility. And I'm not, this isn't a lecture, but it's your own responsibility to try and get as much knowledge as you can about COVID-19 uh, and the SARS-CoV-2 virus from as wide a range of sources as you can. Um, I don't think it's appropriate to just read a couple of papers. I think it's really try and understand this from various different angles. You've got to be a little bit careful because there's a lot of conspiracy theories going on as well at the moment. Um, and I think it's important that we, we use our scientific understanding and our scientific training to allow us to try and go back to when we used to read academic papers and try and understand and try and be quite methodical in the way that we go through things and understand it and make our own decisions. Okay. So, okay. So what am I, what am I trying to do here? 
I'm trying to give you the aims of today is to try and give you a brief overview of the science of, of COVID-19. I'm trying to highlight a few contentious issues and, and in the time frame that we've got here today, this is going to be a few of the contentious issues. I'm not going to be able to sit there and give you a detailed overview of everything. If I did, we'd be here until tomorrow. I'm going to try and clarify a few known unknowns. Sound a bit like Donald Rumsfeld there, but trying to the things that we don't know and we know we don't know them and what specific to dentistry what are some of the red flags we need to be aware of we need to look a little bit about risk in general and i'm going to look a little bit at something called lifetime risk and i'd like to thank a, a friend of mine called andrew haig for the for the discussions that we've had offline about this topic um, you may know him as micro dentist on on the facebook groups but a great guy i want to provide some pointers for further debate um, we've all got our own things that we're thinking about in our minds about covid19 but I, just to give you some little things that you might think right well that's an interesting area i want to discuss that i want to think about that a bit more i want to try and think about how we as a dental profession we might need to change and this is important we've obviously got this incredible massive sea change to our lives at the moment we're not able to work we're worried about the fact that these acute access centers are not geographically spread as perhaps we were told they were so we're thinking at the moment well you know when are we going to go back to working how are we going to go back to working how can i go back to working in my dental practice the way it's set out how do I feel about exposing my staff to potential issues if we go back to working? How do I feel about perhaps exposing my patients to issues? And then leading on from that, how do you think our patients actually expect us to change going forward? Do you think they do? Do you think they're looking at us as a reassuring presence in the future? And a, a bit of stability in this sea of car, a bit of a stability in this sea of disquiet or do you think they're actually thinking well no i think you guys got to be leaders and show us and convince us that we can come to see you in a safe environment and feel confident about that okay the objectives of the course today is to try and enhance your knowledge base about the science of covid19 the sars cov2 virus and try to be a little bit specific to dentistry to give some clarity to the areas of contention the known unknowns and red flags as much as I can specific to dentistry, to try and discuss risk and the concept of lifetime risk and a sensible approach to it. I think that's really important. It's gotta be sensible. And to stimulate debate about how the dental profession may need to adapt and how our patients may expect us to change. So let's have a look. Let's go to this first area and have a brief look at the current science. You'll see there we've got a large graphic of this coronavirus. And what's apparent on there is you'll see these beautifully depicted protuberances on the surface of the virus. And they're actually the spike protein. And they're particularly involved in the way that the virus actually can gain access to our cells. But we'll discuss that in a little bit more detail later. Now, I'm not here to, sit, to teach grandma to suck eggs. Um, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of you guys probably know more about it than I do. Um, one thing I'm quite good at, I'm a little bit autistic and I, I do find that I'm quite good at reading paper after paper after paper and being quite forensic about how I do that. And I'm going to try and bring that to the table today, but I'm not here to try and patronise anybody. And I'm sorry, I'll apologise before and if any of the information I'm going to give you now is a little bit basic and you've read it 50 times before. Uh, some of the stuff I'm going to tell you, you may not know, and hopefully you'll find it interesting as well. But I do apologize again, the next slide is a little bit heavy in detail. Okay, so let's, let's look at a quote first. And this isn't about coronavirus or COVID-19, it's about any virus really. A virus is simply a piece of bad news wrapped up in a protein. I think that really hits it on the, the nail on the head. That was by Jean, Jean and Peter Medouard in 1977, all those years ago. But they, hit, they really did it the nail on the head. That's exactly what it is. So SARS-CoV-2 
it's a co coronavirus. It's a little bit similar to the, well, it's quite similar to the SARS-CoV-1 virus that we know from 2002, 2003, when we had an a, original epidemic coming from, we, we think perhaps wet markets in China. And it caused a lot of infections and a fair number of deaths, but absolutely nothing, nothing like the scale of deaths, the scale of infections, the scale of worldwide penetration that we've got with COVID-19, the, the cov 2 virus. It's also quite similar to MERS, which is the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome virus. And that, that virus um, is interesting for very many reasons. One of them is its death rate is 35% incredibly high and we're so in some ways it, a little silver lining of this one at the moment is whatever your case fatality rate that you come to believe in it's nowhere near that and we're so lucky about that it's a beta coronavirus and there's four types of coronaviruses others let's think about alpha coronaviruses these these are the ones that cause the common cold we tend to find with those that you can get immunity to them but it tends to wane after a year or so. We're not sure with this uh, the COVID-19 virus whether we're going to get long-term immunity or not. The bats, bats seem to be the host of these things. So beta coronaviruses seem to be harboured by bats. The bats seem to be able to go about their daily lives without any negative effects from harbouring the viruses. And what they tend to do is they tend to act as a primary host or a primary vector. And then what happens is that they often you'll have a secondary zoonotic vector, which means another animal will become a, a kind of an intermediate vector for a slightly changed version of the virus. So, for example, for SARS-1 in 2002, 2003, it went to civic cats. Um, for the MERS virus, it's still in dromedary camels, originally from bats again. And for the SARS-CoV-2 virus, it appears, and we're, we're not sure about this at the moment, but it's gone from horseshoe bats to horned pangolins, which is a, a very unusual, beautiful animal, and then to humans. And there's a lot of controversy about that still, yeah, at the moment. And I'm not gonna spend this, this webinar talking about that too much. It's quite a big virus. It's an RNA virus. RNA viruses are interesting. They're normally fairly small, but this one's a biggie. Uh, it's got a lot of characters inside that central RNA portion. It's codes for 29 proteins inside there. In fact, some we're not sure of yet. Several of them I'm going to just quickly talk about. We've got the spike protein that I alluded to a few seconds ago when we looked at that big graphic of the virus. The spike protein is these prongs stick sticking out of the surface. And it's integral to the way that that virus can attack you, how it can attack your cells. And it attacks a receptor, uh, it appears, called the ACE2 receptor. Now this is a receptor that's, we, we call it expressed. If it's, if it's on the surface of your cell, it's expressed. And you can have variable expression. So you can have some cells that express it a little bit and some that express it a hell of a lot. And some of the cells that express it a lot include ones in your airway, in your respiratory system, in your gut, testicular cells, the Sertoli cell of the, of the male testicle, for example, very, very high expression of uh, ACE2. And yet, funnily enough, going off the point a little bit, it appears COV-2 isn't sexually transmitted, which by males to females, and that's interesting because there is high expression of the ACE2 within the male reproductive system. So again, just looking at how complex this all is, you need something, you need a protease with your ACE2 receptor to allow the vi virus to get into your cell. And it's a TMP, TMPR, double S2, and it's expressed wider than your ACE2. So some cells will have that and they won't have the ACE2, but you need them both. And one of the really interesting things about this at the moment, and this is, this is fascinating to me, Again, I'm a bit autistic, so it may not be fascinating to you guys, but it seems to target specific types of cell within your nose. 
and this is where it comes into the dental sphere and we've got to be aware of this we're working on patients mouths and we've got this nose right in front of us all the time and it appears the nose is a primary viral reservoir for this illness and why is that well it appears that these two receptors together this protease and this receptor together it targets your nasal goblet cells and the ciliated cells within this area of your nose and your nasopharynx. And that's different than SARS-1, where it really targeted something called a type 2 alveolar cell, the AT2 cell, which was present within your bronchioles. And that's, again, a little bit controversial, but it provides a red flag to me that these nasal secretions, these secretions that are coming from your nose, post-nasal drip into the oropharynx, patients coughing, patients actually sneezing, patients just tidal breathing. So this is where rather than actually coughing in your face or sneezing when they've got rubber dam on, your patient instead of that is actually just tidal breathing. So just breathing in and out, your normal respiratory rate, However, just think about it, when you've got your patient in the chair, you've got your rubber dam on, what are they doing then? The tidal breathing mainly through the nose. And that we've been, it's been shown now that you do get a respiratory secretion aerosol from the nose during tidal breathing. And we go back to the point again, that the primary reservoir of the COVID-19 is thought to be the nasal goblet and ciliated cells so therefore we've got some red flags there that i'll talk about later so when we're thinking about medicines to deal with this and there's nothing currently available despite what donald trump will tell you uh, the french study regarding uh, hydroxychloroquine was a poor study and i'll talk about that a little bit more later as well but the major target for the therapeutics which are going to come far quicker than a vaccine is this H2 receptor. Um, and, you know, that's, that's also something that we're, we're, we're hopeful that things are going to come through and come online. Uh, randomized controlled trials are going to allow us to actually see whether these things are having an effect or whether it's anecdotal and it's small case studies. Just talking very quickly about another couple of proteins. So we talked it makes a lot of proteins. There's one called ORF6. It blocks signals from your cells. So you get a cell, gets infected with this virus, and it would normally send signals out to the immune system to allow your innate immune system to start fighting this virus. But unfortunately, this ORF6 protein actually dampens down that immune response it stops your cell sending the signals out and that's a bit tricky dicky isn't it really and and so what we're finding is that your innate immunity the immunity that happens immediately after you get infected with a virus in the first days is dampened down by this virus and that's why you can have patients who are sitting there infected for four or five days no symptoms whatsoever but unfortunately, that inane immune response is getting dampened down. That is a real issue because then when the virus has really achieved maximum penetration within your cells and it's, the viral load is replicating massively and you really are full of virus, that's when you, you can't mount an effective immune response or you have an abnormal immune response that's so massively mixed up that you end up with things such as a cytokine storm and you end up in ICU. So just there's other proteins as well. And this is the last little bit of heavy science at the moment, but there's other sets proteins that this virus releases that can actually cause your cells to stimulate them to die. So you get apoptosis with these cells and you get loads of cells actually dying. And because your ciliated cells and your lungs are failing, they can't be cleared from the lung. So therefore, it leads to your lungs filling up, not just with mucus, with, um, with uh, the fluids, um, the exudate coming from your open capillaries, but it's also dead cells as well. So it all starts to make a picture of a very, very nasty virus that's really quite targeted to do as much damage as it can. So anyway, look, we've got loads of information on COVID-19 with too much information. 
And that's talking from somebody like me who loves information. I'm finding it, it just my head's exploding with the amount of information. We've got information overload. We've got it from multiple sources. We've got a massive increase in the number of papers that have been submitted to academic sites. Many of them are preprints. And what I mean by a preprint is a paper that hasn't actually been peer reviewed yet. So these papers are whacked in. They've got some of them are really interesting they've got amazing hypotheses and things that's going on but they haven't actually been either peer-reviewed they haven't been checked there could be a load of rubbish and there's so many of them and i've been reading a lot of these and i've been trying to share some of the important ones on facebook and i've been doing that on a particular site called the coronavirus and COVID-19 dentistry discussion group and i would advise you if none of you are on that group try and get on it there's some rubbish on it there's also some stuff that's not particularly, I think, science-based, but there's also a hell of a lot of good information on there. And I would, you know, the first learning of today, get yourselves on that site and have a look through some of the papers and have a look through some of the things that are posted on there. So what are they, what's the issues I've gleaned from my reading these papers? The main thing I've gleaned so far is loads of these papers are just small case series reports so it's some of them from china some of them from other countries italy from france the papers that are a small case series of patients with covid19 you may only have five patients six children patients 12 patients there's loads of statistical modeling so these these small case series are magnified up or we're trying to look at geographical things with a few different sites and we're trying to massively model them and use complex uh, mathematical programs to give us bigger picture analyses of these things and you've got to be aware that these things are full of flaws so you've got to take them not with a pinch of salt but i think you have to be very aware of the fact that it's likely that some of this isn't going to be true. A lot of the papers I'm reading are, are about repurposing current th therapeutics. So we've got thousands and thousands of drugs currently around in the world. They're FDA approved. There's, there are all these drugs that are very, very useful and they're used for a variety of already different things. And a lot of the papers are about repurposing those drugs. But the problem we seem to be seeing with these papers is that they're doing very, very short or small case series. The patients are on multiple therapies at the same time. So they're having more than one of these drugs at the same time. They're often having other therapeutic interventions at the same time as well. So the confounding factors of these little studies are such that it's very hard to make a, a Trumpian gesture and say, hydroxychloroquine definitely works. Well, I'm sorry. I'm afraid we don't know that yet. We do know certain things about chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. One thing we do know is that chloroquine is far more dangerous than hydroxychloroquine. But we don't know. We don't, we, we don't know whether hydroxychloroquine mixed with azanthromycin, the, uh, the uh, antibiotic, whether that's actually safe for a start. We do know previous reports that it causes a hepat hepatotoxic effect. It affects your liver. We don't know. There's no randomized control trials finished at the moment. There's plenty happening. There's a massive trial happening in the UK at the moment. I've released details of that on that previous Facebook site. And that's looking at hydroxychloroquine. Um, but unfortunately, like all these type of scientific endeavors, it takes time to do. It takes time to recruit the right number of patients. It takes time then to do the appropriate amount of time with the study to actually get beneficial data afterwards. And I've got to be honest with you, my opinion is the standard of submission of a lot of the papers I'm seeing at the moment is slipped. And I'm particularly talking about the preprint papers that we're seeing rather than the ones that have actually been accepted to mainstream journals. But some of them aren't particularly good either. So anyway, briefly now, further reading and watching that I want you guys to do. And you can either say, okay, Dom, or you can say, but they're off. I don't want to do that. So further reading and watching. Firstly, get yourselves on YouTube and I want you to look at MedCram. MedCram is a really useful medical resource. It's often used for medical students who are trying to cram for lectures, but it's also very, very useful for anybody who's got a medical leaning. Um, specifically, the MedCram coronavirus pandemic updates. Watch them, please. Very important. 
Google Scholar, uh, get yourselves on there. They've got a COVID-19 resource center and you get access to loads of free papers from many of the real key mainstream journals. Get yourselves on there. If you want something a bit lighter and a bit more mainstream, have a look at the New Yorker magazine. You should be able to get articles from there without having to pay for a subscription. And they've got some of the very best COVID-19 articles that I've read on there. Easy to read, but very detailed. And it's not just your top line stuff. What I want you to try and avoid, and again, you can listen to me or not, is try to avoid all these conspiracy theories. I don't think it's big. I don't think it's clever. And I don't think it's a sign of any unique insight or a rarefied intelligence that we think, oh, wow, we know about these conspiracy theories and I agree with them. I think it's just us. What we're doing is we're looking for patterns when the locus of control, which we think we've got all the time in our lives, has been grabbed and taken away from us. And that's what we're doing. So what are, the, what are the contentious issues that I'm seeing? And as I said to you at the beginning, I can only pick a few of these. So I'm going to, from the top of my head, um, we don't know the case fatality rate. Um, what, what do I mean by that? What I mean is that we're, we're basically in the middle of a pandemic. And what you tend to find with pandemics that have fatality as an outcome is that you get a very high case fatality rate at the beginning and it tends to decline over time. And that's fairly obvious from a logic point of view that that's going to happen. You tend to also find with the way that testing is done in various countries, and Italy is a good example of this, that the testing is very heavily weighted towards people who are already very sick. They're in hospital, they've self-attended or they've been referred to hospital. Um, you tend to find when testing is more randomised, such as, for example, Germany, you'll get a very different case fatality rate from that randomised information. And it seems to be below 1%. So we're looking at a, a, good, a good example at the moment of, that people are talking about is about 0.9%. When you look at a very small, such as the, uh, the cruise ship uh, example, you can see it's even lower than that, about 0.6%. So the, the, the bottom lines we don't know at the moment. And it's interesting with SARS-1, that at some stage during the late stages of the of the epidemic they were thinking about four percent and it actually went up later to nine so it can go the other way as well and i think that's important and i think that you know it's not just a a fact that we all come all can wipe the sweat from our brows and say oh, it's going to be far lower we're not sure we think it probably is but we're not sure we don't know, we, as, as dentists, do we really know what level of risk aerosols pro, pose to us? I don't think we do. I think we know they pose a risk, but we don't know what level that risk is at all. We don't, we don't know the parameters of our immunity if we're going to have it. We know it declines for alpha co um, uh, coronaviruses, uh, such as the common cold. So, for example, if you get a common cold, a few years later, you can get the same common cold again. So you can get it as a kid and you can get it as a teenager again, the same one, because your immunity's declined. It's not gone, but it's declined. For SARS-1 and MERS, some patients have a long-lasting immunity. But specifically for MERS, the cadre of patients, the cohort of patients after, is so small you can't make a big judgment on that. Some of them have lifelong immunity or they've got immunity, you know, 10 years later. Others really haven't. And, you know, we're already hearing early reports for SARS-CoV-2 that some people appear to have very quick decline in immunity, even now. And uh, there was one paper, preprint, unfortunately, that said it was 30% for a Chinese cohort had lost their immunity already. That's worrying. But as I say, it's, it's early days. We don't know. We don't know. What we know about this is that coronaviruses tend to mutate all the time, and that's something common with RNA viruses. And they tend to mutate, often very at the very beginning, it's into something a bit more nasty, and that happened here. And then you get further massive number of mutations, and it tends to lead to a decline in virulence. And you often find the virulence goes down quite quickly after that. And, and it's unusual for the virulence to then keep staging up and getting worse. And I'm hoping that's the case here, but we don't know. We don't, we can't really explain outlier countries yet at all. We can't really fully understand why, for example, Germany's death rate is so much lower 
we don't have all the factors that, that, that give us a full explanation of that. We don't know why Italy's was so much higher. We've got many reasons that could explain it, but we don't know yet. We can't, can we really trust the Chinese figures at the moment? It worries me that we're not getting a true picture. I think that being a bit more finessed about it, I think that we are getting trends that are truthful, but whether we're getting an exact figure, I'm not so sure about that because of state interference about that. Um, we don't know any of the long-term sequelae of infection for this particular thing yet because we haven't had a long term yet. We're getting early worrying reports of things such as wedge infarctions in the lungs. A wedge infarction is something that appears on CT scan or plain x-ray where you've got a section of your lung coming up to one of the minor bronchioles that's dead. That doesn't sound good. Uh, we've got early reports that are very mixed. Some, some are saying that you get lung fibrosis, others are saying you don't. What I know is that I'm really praying that we don't end up with a, a, a world full of respiratory cripples after this. Um, we don't have any concrete exit strategies yet. It's all very well, um, you know, thinking, oh, we're going to come back to work here and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. We haven't got any concrete ways that we're going to do that. It's obviously the case that when we get a number of new cases reducing to a certain level, when we get death rates reducing, when we have passed the peak of this curve that we're talking about, then we can start looking at exit strategies and, and people will be doing that already. What's really interesting though, is that there's no actual statistical analysis. There's no scientific consensus on how low your cases need to be before you can look at your exit strategy and av avoid a secondary uh, pandemic or a secondary surge happening at a later time. What we really don't want is a secondary surge happening perhaps late autumn, so that in the middle of the flu season, in the middle of winter, we've got a second massive surge of cases again and we overwhelm our better equipped intensive care services in the UK. So thinking a bit more about dentistry, we haven't got crazy leadership in dentistry. I don't know, I think the word on the street in dentistry at the moment is that we're all very disappointed and disillusioned with the leadership that we've seen from our CDO and from uh, various people. We don't appear to be getting keys of guidance. The leadership appears to have been rather dismissive of us. Uh, areas of the profession appear to, have, uh, areas of the profession rather appear to have almost been ignored or dismissed in a rather them and us attitude. Uh, and it's really, it's highlighted problems that have been there in the longer term, in the longer term. And it's really sort of like this acute situation has made them very apparent now. So we don't have uniform guidance. And we've got a bit of a fear culture, haven't we? I think all of us in the UK dental profession are a little bit frightened of our, how our heavy touch regulator, for example. I think there's a lot of us are in a silent majority a lot of the time. So for example, if we've got issues with the regulator and we try to do a petition or something, you'll see that many people will probably support it very much. But they won't want to put the names on it and they won't want to put their heads above the parapet. Again, that's important. Okay, so some things we do know. We know that surgical procedures involved in the nasooral regions are risk factors for infection for medics and for dentists. And we need to try and, we've got to be worried about the aerosolization of the COVID-19 virus. What we're not able to do is quantify that risk. So we're not able to say, well, it's this risk. We know it's a risk, but we don't know what the risk is. We know that we've got a big cadre of asymptomatic patients. Uh, they could be mildly symptomatic. So they could have, for example, a typical symptom such as a major upper respiratory tract symptom. So for example, a runny nose, red eyes, a tickly cough, for example. But rather than that dry, persistent cough, they may have a wet, productive cough. You've got patients with a wide variety of symptoms. It appears that an osmia or reduced um, smell are a, a feature in many cases now. Uh, and some studies are suggesting that we've actually got a massive cadre of patients and people in the community who have had no symptoms whatsoever, but are still shedding the virus. And we'll talk about that with more about 
that later. What's clear is we do know we should stop doing elective procedures in dentistry and that's pretty clear, isn't it? What I know and what I think a lot of us know and I think a lot of us are worried about is that we've got to wear it if we're going to do necessary procedures on our patients, we need to wear appropriate personal protective equipment. And for me, that's really not the N95 mask, which has got very, some studies suggesting it's next to useless. We want FPP3 masks from an, an approved supplier that's had these things tested. We want eye goggles. We don't just want a face shield. We want goggles over our eyes to protect, to protect our conjunctivity. Our conjunctivity may well be a way for the virus to enter our bodies. We're not 100% sure about that either. We want a full face shield as well. We want to cover our hair, we want gown with long sleeves and we want gloves. And we don't have adequate generation of what really is the only aerosol generation procedures that we have in dentistry. For example, let's look at extraction of a tooth. Oh, it's not aerosol generating. But actually is it, if you've got a patient who's struggling in it and vigorously nasal breathing as you try and take the tooth out, I think it's clear that you have got a nasal respiratory secretion aerosol coming in and out of that patient's nose all the way through. So I think that the other thing we do know is we need training and compliance in donning and doffing our PPE. There's no point just whacking it on and doing the treatment and then taking it off and contaminating ourselves by it. We need to ideally, and this is not going to happen, but we ideally should be doing this in a separate room from the surgical room. Um, a best practice really is to have a, a donning and doffing buddy. So we've got somebody watching us taking this stuff off and they can really instruct us and make sure that we're not taking it off in a way where we're contaminating ourselves. And that's best practice that's happening in hospitals at the moment. I'm not going to talk about positive pressure rooms and things like that, which aren't going to happen either. But, you know, again, we could be looking at situations where these positive pressure uh, rooms are available and, and they're actually... Uh, another way of safeguarding ourselves from these airborne aerosols. So why is our advice not being standardised in dentistry in the UK? Well, the first thing is, and we all know this, we waited four days for the English CDO to input at all. And this is after the Welsh, Scottish and Welsh CDOs had provided guidance. So we're sitting there reading this fairly good guidance and thinking, well, where's our guidance? And then when it did come, they weren't very good. So that, you know, for me, it was poor, it was inaccurate, it was contradictory, and it was old hat. What's going on there? So there's no consensus about what our high-risk procedures are beyond the blanket term aerosol generating. And as I just alluded to before, we're not 100% sure what is and what isn't aerosol generating. And we're not even really sure what are aerosols, and I'm going to talk about that as well. So then we've got really good advice from the BSOS, British Society of Oral Surgery, and their Lancet letter, I mean, Paul Cotetile's letter, uh, super, absolutely excellent. And that's unfortunately at odds a little bit with the Public Health in England guidance, their, uh, their graphic that they did, it's different. And yet where dentists and dental care professionals sit in there reading this stuff and we're thinking, well, what do we do? What do we do? And we're not getting that leadership that tells us what to do. And I am getting angry about this. And I'm sorry it's a webinar and I shouldn't be, but I'm angry about it. I really am. There's a lack of clarity on the benefit of surgical masks. You know what I mean by surgical masks, the day-to-day -day masks, the ear ones or the ones you tie around the back of your neck. For wearers, we accept the fact now that for people who are surrounding you when you're wearing them they've got a lower chance of uh, virus coming in but for the area we're not sure about that we know that the, the, the they're not actually they don't prevent penetration of uh, virions of 70 to 120 nanometers in diameter at all so these things are coming in when they do come in are they staying in if we're already infected by the virus, so we're breathing it out, and we'll say we're asymptomatic, we've got this mask on, and we're breathing it out and creating a massive viral load inside the mask. That's interesting. There's a lack of transparency, transparency from the government and from our dental leaders about detailed stock information for specific 
PPE items. Now, for this, I'm really talking about masks. We know we've got a lot of masks. Do we know we've got a lot of PP, uh, FPP3 masks? Or have we just got a lot of surgical masks? And do we actually know if surgical masks are any good anyway? And if they aren't, and we find out later and we've been using them, what does that mean? So for me, again, we're in this sort of shallow shadow place where we've not been told things and we've been told other things and we're, we're kind of lost and I'm really unhappy about it. The other thing that's interesting is there's no information at the moment that's suggesting that dentists or DCPs have an excess risk of infection with the COVID-19 disease from the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. That information isn't available at the moment. So I'm not, we're not seeing published papers showing that dentists have got an increased risk of this. And if you think about it, if we really are getting infected by these aerosols, and we have been and it, during this initial phase of this pandemic, you might expect to see that, but you might not as well. So I think that's an important point and we need to be looking for that evidence as, as much as we can. And that's going to define what we do next. So what do I actually want in a leader? Uh, I do apologise if this offends anybody, uh, but I think it's a good example of how somebody who I think is one of the greatest, well, the greatest leader that's ever lived in the modern world can also be thought of as a figure of great uh, ridicule and, and thought of as somebody who's got a really evil side by, by similar groups of intelligent people with different views. So what do we really want? And I don't think dentists are an easy group to please. Um, I know I'm not. And I'm sure a lot of you aren't either. So leadership, what do we want? And this isn't aimed at any one person. And I know some of you are probably thinking he's aiming this at one particular person here. And I'm not. It's a systemic failure that we've got. We've got a case where we, had, we already had a bloody epidemic in 2002-03. And there was all the good words coming across the word. Oh, we're going to prepare. We're going to prepare. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And by 2006, that preparation had gone by the by. And all the research on vaccines had gone on the back burner. And part of that was because big pharma don't make money from vaccines. That's part of the reason. But part of it is our own need for order and our own ability as human beings to put these big risks behind us and move forward. And in a dangerous way, we've actually done that here. We're a comfortable country. We're a very affluent country. We've got plenty of time on our hands sitting there on our phones. We, we, we worry more about gender neutral toilets than we've been thinking about things that might never happen. So anyway, let's look at a hypothetical a hypothetical scenario. So let's think about a leader in dentistry who provides a keenly awaited webinar. Loads of people want to watch it and it's well publicised beforehand. Let's think about the webinar itself and it starts off badly enough with a threat about something <laughs> to, to a certain person. Then there's gremlins all the way through it. So they're, oh, it's one thing after another, it goes mute everything else happening. There's no eye contact all the way through. So no eye contact all the way through. And there's loads of real politic happening. We can see it, we can smell it, we can taste it all the way through. There's contradiction after contradiction. There's so little new information from beginning to end that we're all thinking, well, what's, what are we getting from this? And I think at the end of it, we've got a really lost audience. I know I was completely lost and a little bit I felt a bit of shame, actually, for the dental profession, really. And I think we had one very worried April Fooler as well. <laughs> um, so how might it have played out, hypothetically, again? So the leader, perhaps the webinar is just building on really timely, accurate inputs from the start of the crisis. So we've had a situation where the leader is on top of the game and they're working with other key, key other people key responsible people and giving us that information in a timely accurate way and where they don't have the information to give us they're telling us that too the command respect because the process of getting that leadership position was transparent it was merit-based it wasn't a political appointment it was a merit-based appointment the webinar itself is polished so it works well there's very few gremlins and if there is one it's a joke's made of it and it 
Bill's report. It's honest, it's candid, it's clear, there's eye contact. People actually feel that they've got somebody in front of them who actually cares, and he's one of them. Perhaps, uh, let's think hypothetically, an ill junk, junk judge joke is mentioned, say a silly letter. But the joke is reminded of the gravity of the situation and, and the team, which is our team, the leader and our team will move on. And you might end up with an audience that's Sorry, confused. Mate. Hello. Sorry, I'm just going to, just a quick question here that I, I, I kind of think is relevant to answer now. Uh, any idea what other countries are doing with regards to dentistry kind of post peak infected phase? Well, it appears there's a, there's a variety of different strategies in place at the moment. Um, we've got, um, we tend to be looking at certain different areas. So uh, Germany, for example, at the moment, are, are looking at um, enhanced uh, personal protective equipment. They're looking at reduced throughput of patients. The, they're also looking at having a, either an immunity passport or some form of documentation that patients have either had the virus and gained immunity uh, or not. And they're looking then at um, enhanced wipe down procedures and uh, patient throughput procedures as they enter the practices. So they are actually working on that at the moment. Um, but other information on that rather than wasting the, the webinar or not wasting it, but just taking up more time. I'm happy to provide a set of papers afterwards on uh, today, either on on here or on or on the FB, the Facebook group, that show what other countries are doing at the moment uh, in that post-infective surge phase. If that's all right, Rob. Yes, it is. Uh, we can, if you give us the papers afterwards, mate, we uh, we can share them as well with the email that will come through to people in the next four or five. Minutes. Lovely. Lovely. I'm happy to do that. I think the German one's a really, really good one. Um, and as I say, it's very detailed and I'll, I'll give that first. And then there's, there's a couple of others that are useful as well. Um, the American Dental Association uh, paper is also very interesting and good as well. Um, but unfortunately in America, you'll find that it's, uh, you're not getting one set of advice there. You're getting a lot of different strands of advice. And again, that fits in with the fact that this is an emerging threat and we're not 100% sure. We haven't got all the parameters in our minds yet. So anyway, going back to this slide, I was talking about this hypothetical slide. We've got an, in, at the end of this hypothetical webinar, we've got an enthused audience. So we've got an audience that may well be feeling a bit dispirited about the whole situation, but they're enthused about the way that dentistry is coming together on this. And they feel part of this monumental team effort and they want to move things forward. And historical issues that they may have with dentistry are, are put on the back burner because they really feel that they're part of this new team. And that ain't what we got, hypothetically. So is it, you know, is it is this partly our own fault? I mean, do we get what we deserve? I mean, dentists, uh, as I said before, as I alluded to a few minutes ago, we're a difficult group, aren't we? We seem to self-select rather unusual personality types in dentistry not always bad types but there's you know there's a lot of real personality extremes in dentistry and i think that a lot of you are probably laughing and looking at me and thinking yeah absolutely um do we get what we deserve do we are combination of this fear culture that we've got so we don't like really putting our heads above the parapet combined with the fact that we're so busy in our individual businesses and we're so busy getting on and we've got busy lives and the rest of it and we've allowed ourselves to be bent over and ended up with this situation where we're having to see a million patients a day and we've got no time and we've got all these paperwork to do and we're ending up 50 percent of our time is doing contemporary contemporaneous notes and we're panicking and we're thinking any day now we're going to get a DLP bloody letter through the door or we're going to get a GDC referral through the door and we're, we're basically in this terrible situation but are we have we allowed this not allowed it to happen but have we kind of sat there and let it happen and do we need to stop it right now and change it have we allowed a quasi-ceremonial position at the head of the dental profession here which has got so little bite and it doesn't even really actually have much to do with the private dentist, does it? Do we struggle to unite behind a leader? I think we do. And I think that, that may not be something that we can suddenly get over. I think it's because we've got disparate strands within the profession. We've got, you know, 
community dentistry, we've got hospital based dentistry, we've got NHS dentistry, we've got mixed, mixed practices, we've got private practices, we've got high end private practices, we've got corporates, we've got the whole lot, we've got an amazingly wide disparate cohort, cohort of people here and we're trying to say we're one profession. And I think, you know, it goes back to the fact we're in the business of caring and I've been a bit sarcastic there. We are, we're, we're, in a, we're in a business which has to make money to be sustainable. But at the same time, we're caring, we're trying to be patient-centred and to do the best for our patients. And sometimes those parameters and those boundaries of what's a business and what's caring can be slightly diluted or slightly... Uh, meld together a little bit good example is the concept of ethical selling you know anyway we won't we'll, we'll talk about that today so what do we want i think we want a merit-based leader we don't want a political appointment i think we're probably going to get another political appointment next term we want one leader for the whole profession for the nhs for private community hospital for mixed for the whole lot we want somebody who's candid we want somebody who's honest we want somebody who's brave and has the guts to stand up and be counted when they need to be. We want somebody who's honest. They can challenge, but they can instill loyalty in people. So we don't want somebody who's like a bull in a china shop, say governmental meetings end up with them being alienated and not getting anywhere. We want somebody who's got the charm to be able to instill loyalty in people, but at the same time, tell them what they want to hear. We want somebody who's going to fight our corner and I think at the moment that feels like wishful thinking a little bit. So it's really up to us. I think at the moment we're in the middle of a once in a hundred year event and that, that, that could be the opposite of hyperbole. We've got the chance at the moment when we're not sitting with our glass of wine, feeling a bit bored and trying to motivate ourselves to do some uh, continuing professional development. We've probably got the chance for a bit of deep thinking for once in our lives rather than top line stuff where we're constantly getting stimulated in 10 directions, we can start having a little bit of a chance for a deep think. You know, if we go out for our walk on a day and we're trying to keep our social distance from people, can we actually start thinking really seriously about the major things that are affecting the world at the moment, us as a civilization? We've got the opportunity at the moment for high quality, secure communication between ourselves. We've got so many different facets to that. We can talk to our, talk to each other, we can talk to ourselves as well, but we can talk to each other uh, in a way that allows us to be uh, secure, end-to-end -end encryption, for example, uh, Telegram, WhatsApp groups, left, right and centre. And I think we have got the opportunity to unite as a profession, and I'd like to just very quickly allude to the fact that we've got private and independent dental groups starting at the moment. We've got some really exciting things happening. And I would be looking again on Facebook and perhaps link up with Jason Smithson at the moment, who's one of the key players in something that I think is very exciting with, with regard to basically bringing this big cadre of private dentists back into the fold a little bit. And I think that that's part of, could the BDA overcome this historical baggage it's got? I mean, the BDA historically seen as an old boys club and not being very effective at all. You know, I think they are far more effective now, but I think that unfortunately they've got so much historical baggage that a lot of people who left them are a bit loath to come back. And I think we need to think about that. I think when we're doing our deep thinking, should we be thinking, well, I think it's time to give them another chance. And I do. And that's me talking, I do. So what are our red flags? Let's look at people pre-infection first and let's look at different groups. So let's look at, at us as dentists and DCPs. So what, let's, it's a red flag for me. Why are we not treated like ENT surgeons and anesthetists? Why aren't we? And again, I'm getting angry here. This really upsets me. We're leaning over people's noses and mouths. We're seeing multiple patients in one day. We're well aware that these patients may well have no symptoms whatsoever and yet still be shedding loads of virus. But we're not treated like ENT surgeons and anaesthetists. The PHE document for non-aerosol generating procedures shows us just with a basically a surgical mask on and a, and a face shield. 
that's not the same. And then let's look at our patients. We've got a duty of care to these people and we've been asked to help. We're sitting there at the moment, we've got patients asking us for help. We're looking at AAA, we're giving patients antibiotics for infections and we're, look, we're thinking, oh my God, we're doing things that don't make logical sense here, but yeah, in the big picture, it's safer to do that. And then we're thinking, what if the infection doesn't go? What if it gets worse? What about where are these acute dental care centers and why aren't they everywhere? And why have we been told we've got them here and we haven't got them? How have we allowed that? And yet we've got these patients who could be ending up with facial swelling. We could have a Ludwig's angina patient whose airway is compromised and having to take an ICU bed up. And we could have patients in these hospitals who are dying on the corridor with COVID. And they've got a dental patient laying in that bed. And they're lying in that bed because there isn't an acute dental care centre nearby and there's no clarity of information from our leaders. And then we've got our staff. We've got these staff who we, we love, these, this family that we work with. And they're dealing with multiple people every day. The waiting areas, the, the, the dealing with patients coming to the desk all the time, they're touching things, they're touching the money, they're handing pens out for signing things, they're picking documents off patients. Patients are leaning over to talk to them about costs of treatment. They're taking the money from the patient, handing the card back to the patient. We've got to think about these people. We've got to care about these people. And what about asymptomatic spreaders? Now there's a China study that's come out that says that 80% of these people with this virus are asymptomatic. There's an Icelandic study that's suggesting that 65% are completely asymptomatic, but they're shedding the virus. It appears the consensus is starting to look at around 50% now, but we don't know exactly. And these two first studies I mentioned could be really wrong. But it does appear that we've got a significant cadre of people who never get ill, never get ill, but they walk around shedding that virus. And it appears it's a younger cadre of people and including children. What it also appears is that we've got a nasal reservoir with a high viral load and that that viral load can become an aerosol during tidal breathing through the nose. We've got droplet nuclei from this respiratory secretion aerosol that can, these droplets that come out when we breathe, that can sit in still air for hours. It can float about for hours. Little virions inside these little tiny little dried up little bits of virus floating about in the air, in the air for hours. What we don't know though, is whether the viral load in that is enough to infect us or not. What we do know for clear is that rubber dam doesn't stop nasal breathing. I mean, we're all aware of the fact when you try and put rubber dam on one of your patients and they've, they've got a blocked nose, it's a nightmare. So you know that most patients need to nasal breathe when they've got rubber dam on. FPP3 masks don't cover your eyes. They might well protect your lungs, but they don't cover your eyes. And they don't, real, they don't deal with a room-based viral load either. And we know that doffing this stuff, so taking this stuff off is so hard to do right. We know that. And we, we know that hospitals are now getting doffing buddies to actually stand there and watch experienced people take the stuff off so they don't contaminate themselves. And that's telling you something about how difficult it is to do it right. And do we really actually really understand aerosols? This frustrated me so much at the beginning of this when I started all this advice about aerosolized procedures. Let's look at three main types of aerosols that us as dentists need to consider. The first one, Respiratory secretions. So the secretions coming from your respiratory system and from your nose, mixing with saliva perhaps, and then you've got droplets being expelled from the nose and from the mouth during breathing, during coughing, during sneezing. It showed, studies now are showing that sneezing can expel those droplets eight meters from your face. <laughs> so that says something about the two, two meter uh, self-isolating position that we've got which I think is again, an example of a compromise. We're not gonna be able to keep eight meters away. But these, what happens is that the droplets come out of your mouth and out of your nose, they're dried in the air, they're desiccated in the air, and then they form something called a droplet nuclei, which contains virions or viral particles, and they float about in the air in an aerosol. And then you've got your clean aerosols coming from your turbine, from your high speed drill, from your three-in-one when you press both buttons. The, 
in some cases, they've actually got antimicrobial agents in that water as well. And think about it, it's not coming towards your face, it's going away from you. And then the third type is the mixed type. So you've got the clean water aerosol from your high speed or from your three in one, mixing with your respiratory saliva pooled secretions in your mouth. And we're not sure about what happens with that. And we're not sure about where it goes. We're not sure about if it reflects off hard surfaces in your mouth and reflects back into your face. We're not sure about that. And we're also not sure what happens when you've got high volume aspiration added to the mix. So therefore we're in a really, it's a complex issue. Aerosols are very complicated. There's scientific journals on aerosols, just on aerosols. And that tells you something about how complicated they are. And to try and just say, well, you know, aerosol, aerosol generating procedures, that's just, it's incredibly simplistic and it's, it's, it's a little bit dangerous as well. And it gets more complex. So we've got still air contamination. So we've got our surgeries that often don't have an open window. And we've got a low air throughput in that surgery. So we've got a patient in there for an hour. There's not, the door's closed. The, the air's sitting there. It's not moving about. We're not sure if our high volume aspiration is helping or hindering. It's probably helping. I was talking to Andre Haig again about something that's uh, about what happens if you, instead of turning, take, taking your high speed down and taking the power down or using your slow speed, what happens if you turn the power up and you're increasing that power of that clean air aerosol going in the direction away from you? Would that actually help? Would that actually take that mixed and that secretory, respiratory secretion aerosol and fire it straight up the air, high volume aspiration? So let's be logical and let's think logically about these things. We don't, again, I'll go back to this point again. We don't know if there's an ex excess morbidity for dentists and DCPs at the moment. So we don't really know how dangerous aerosols are at the moment. So let's talk a little bit about risk. So this is all about risk. What are our risks? What are our patients' risks? Are the risks worth taking? We've always took risks. You know, we're working with patients who can have uh, blood-borne viruses that we know nothing about. So we, we have universal precautions for those risks. But we also tend to be very emotive about risk. We tend to make risks are usually personalized to our lifetime experience. So for example, my being hit by a 10 ton truck when I'm cycling, which is something that happened to me, means that I tend to be a little bit of a nervous passenger in cars now. And that's because in some ways I've quantified the level of risk from car being anything to do with moving vehicles as higher for myself. And that's to do with my own life experience. So we quantify the level of a risk based on our own experiences of risk rather than a true scientific analysis of risk. Lifetime risk, that's a type of risk. So it's a measure of risk that a certain event will happen in your lifetime. All right. So a good example is dying from COVID-19. And I'm not saying that in a patronizing way. I'm saying that in a suitably serious way. It's absolutely awful. And we're all sitting here with our own prime minister in hospital in ICU. Um, from my own Thing. I've got one of my close friends who's a dentist who is now winning the battle, um, but was in ICU on a respirator. And all I can say at the moment is it filled my heart with joy when we got some good news yesterday about him. And one day I'm going to sit with him and we're going to have a drink together and I'm going to probably shed a tear. But anyway, so dying from COVID-19, being run over by a car, drowning in a swimming pool, <laughs> winning the lottery, it's not a risk, I suppose. <laughs> it's a risk buying all the tickets and never win. But a very rough calculation, let's think, let's, now this is really rough, so don't be offended by this, it's, it's rough. 20,000 UK deaths due to COVID-19 pandemic. One prediction from Imperial College uh, after their uh, rather bigger 510,000 prediction earlier on. That gives you a one in 24,000 chance of dying of COVID-19 lifetime risk. So in your life, you've got a one in 24,000 chance of dying of it. 
if you look at the UK population is around 60 million. Now that's a very rough calculation, but it's giving you an idea of a risk. So one in 24,000. And just give you a com comparison, the lifetime risk of dying from any motor accident. So getting knocked over or being in a car, on a motorcycle, all these different motor accidents, about one in a hundred, right? So 240 times more likely. Okay. So why are we so scared? And we're scared for good reasons. Panic, panicking's dumb, but fear is absolutely not dumb. Fear is a human reaction that's a very, very important thing. And it's an evolutionary characteristic that's possibly one of the reasons we're still around as a species. We're, we're full of fear because we've got emotive visual clues all the time. We've got those videos from China in the early days of the, of the epidemic where you had doctors in hospitals in Wuhan screaming. I know I felt, I felt gut-wrenching fear at that time. We've got mask wearers on the streets so walking around and instead of laughing at one that you see occasionally if you're down in London, you're seeing them everywhere now. You're seeing people of various ages, various ethnic backgrounds wearing masks. You know, we've got body bag videos. We've got videos in China where they're driving along, taking a secret video and there's body bags lined up on the street. And we know we've got temporary mortuaries being built. And we know from the latest news in the UK that those mortuaries are getting bodies put in them before they're even finished. We've got every reason to have fear. We've got a need, to a need for order in our lives. We need to try and create patterns in our lives. And that's why we're getting help about conspiracy theories. We're getting worried about them. We're thinking, Christ, it's a bioweapon. This is something that's gone wrong. We've had a leaked bioweapon. And they're trying to do, it's, it's the, basically, it's the Chinese version of Chernobyl. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons why those things can appear very, very uh, true. We have got a communist regime in China that's pretty, pretty disgraceful in a lot of ways. But it doesn't mean the whole thing's true. And I think, again, we've got to be very, very careful about these things. We're, we're starting to all know people who've had the virus, and some of us know people who are in hospital, and that's going to increase. We're going to start knowing people who've died from the virus. We're seeing our livelihoods crashing in front of our eyes at the moment. We're looking at our bank statements. We're looking at what we've got in the bank. We're thinking about, oh God, I wish I'd saved a bit more. Damn, I wish I'd done this. God, I wish I'd just bought that. Bloody hell, I bought that for the practice. Do you think I can send it back? We've got this massive information overload and I think this webinar is probably adding to that. But we have. We've got complex, scientifically confusing parameters. We've got all these scientific papers about things that we had no knowledge about before. We're now becoming experts in respiratory viruses that we, you know, did we really have much knowledge of them before? No. Do we know much about different innate immune responses, the monocyte? Do we know about natural killer cells? Well, we need to at the moment. We've got no consensus from anybody about what the outcomes of this is going to be. For our worldviews, not just for the world, but for our worldviews, for us, and we're massively confronted with our own mortality. Every time we put the news on, every time we open a paper, mortality is in front of us. And the locus of control that we thought we all had, and we, we don't really have it, but we thought we had it, has been taken off us and handed to a little person with spiky coating called a virus. And we've lost faith in authority. I mean, we have. I mean, just look at the news. Just look at the way that the post-Brexit Britain is looking at the current government at the moment. And now our own Prime Minister, and, you know, I'll, I'll make no bones about the fact I like Boris Johnson, but that's neither here nor there. But he's laying fine for his life in hospital. And we've already got the backbiting and the uh, going on manoeuvres happening among some of his ministers, you know, and it's not just Govi this time. But let's think about other things. We've got Sweden who are not following the consensus with regard to social isolation policy at all. But if you, got, if you go on Worldometer every day, which gives us very accurate statistics of new cases of coronavirus, new mortality rates, country by country, region by region, have a look at Sweden. It's very interesting. They're not following our socialization, our isolation policy, our lockdown whatsoever. We'll just look at where their uh, statistics are compared to ours. Do we really believe the Chinese data? I know that I'm sceptical, 
I know that I think that there's one of the things from reading a lot of scientific papers is I'm starting to see papers that I think very, very heavily scientific papers that for me are examples of state sponsored disinformation and if anybody's interested i can give you a couple of those papers after there's a couple of them are very interesting they're starting to um in a very technical way cast aspersions on some of the things that we think we know about this virus you know after brexit can we unite behind our government and i'm not sure that we can how we can and again going back to this previous point we don't respect our dental leaders at all at the moment and things have to change so continuing the debate we need clarification on a few things and we need to this is one of the things right at the beginning of this webinar when i said you need to keep your, your knowledge base as wide and as deep as you can because we need to understand things for our own personal benefit here one of them is what's going to happen are we going to have a second wave is china going to have a second wave china's opened wuhan the whole who by promise province is now opening back for business. I hope, I really hope they don't have a second wave. It's interesting how they've said the second wave will come from people coming back into the country, but I'm not sure that's the case either. I'm really hoping that we don't have a second wave there. I think that has a very, very deep and appalling impact on the world if they do a really big one. I think we need to have some more understanding of immunity and I think that's where unfortunately vaccines are going to take 18 months if our immunity is such that we retain enough immunity for a large cohort of people to remain immune and for that concept of herd immunity to work and I think that it's such a complex subject that we're nowhere near understanding whether that's the case yet or not. We don't understand the effect of climate on this virus. You'll notice if you look at Worldometer again, you'll notice that it appears to be in a specific area of the world that appears to be having heavy numbers of these cases and, and heavy numbers of mortality at the moment. Sub-Saharan Africa doesn't appear to be having that. Is that climate based? Are we going to have a burnout of this virus this summer? Are we going to get temperatures above 22 degrees centigrade? Some papers are suggesting above that temperature, we start seeing the virus struggle. Are we going to get that? We're we going to have a bit of a heat wave this summer. Let's hope we do. And let's hope if we do, let's see this virus burn out. Are we going to get clarification on what happens after you've recovered from this? There's some new studies coming through at the moment about something called hypoxic um, uh, leukoencephalopathy and that's a very very awful thing and it's basically where you, your central nervous system starts demyelinating several weeks after a really heavy hypoxic episode such as if you had the bends if you were a deep sea diver or if you were in high altitude and you got high altitude al altitude sickness and there's some reports coming through that happening with patients who've recovered from covid19 however i must be very clear there's nothing that i actually va value as a good source yet on that but we need to keep an eye out for that we need to keep an eye out for how we're going to end up with patients who've got lung fibrosis shortened lifespans needing enhanced support for the rest of their lives or are we all the vast majority of people going to recover from this like a bad dose of the flu and end up living their lives at a normal lifespan and everything else and the other thing we need to be thinking about and clarification on is future threat mitigation because you know i don't know about you guys but I don't want this happening again without us have done everything we possibly can as an advanced human species to be able to bloody uh, avoid that or try to mitigate that risk. You know, it's all very well reopening the, let's say it is the wet markets in Wuhan that cause this. If we're going to reopen them, let's make sure there's no more wild animals there. But let's not be facile about this. There's so many other sources of danger in the world that we, we face at the moment with regard to this. And we, there's so much danger with regard to the fact that we, we, we quantify the amount of research we do medically with how much fiscal benefit there is for the big farmer. And we need to look at that very carefully as well. And so as dentists and DCPs, when are we going to be able to go back to work? 
at the moment my own particular feelings and this is just purely me from the top of my head i'm thinking by mid-may we're going to be seeing a strategy on reduced isolation measures we're going to see geographical areas that remain hot spots and we're going to see regard regarding the uk we're going to see areas that de-escalate the lockdown at different rates and that's going to have effects with regard to dental care so we may not get a country-wide or a uk-wide response with regard to how the services reopen can we work like we did before it's quite easy to think well no way it's never going to be like it was before but actually if, it, if we get studies that show that dentists have not got an increased rate of getting infected or morbidity from infection is it true we can't work like we did before then do we actually want to work like we did before? And I think what I'm trying to touch on here is, do we want dentistry to be like it was before? Do we? You know, and I hold my hand up, I'm part of the problem here as well. You know, I'm, I'm a bit of a disruptor on social media and I'm, I'm thinking about that. And I'm thinking about how we've got the new shoots of being a dentistry-wide professional team here again. And now we need that so much because at the moment we need to take back control of our profession. We need to make sure our profession is dentist led, wet fingered dentist led, that we've got dentists who know what it means to be a dentist regulating us. So how might we need to change if we do need to change as dentists? We might need to install air purification systems in our practices, ultraviolet light, heat, HEPA filters, we might need to be reducing the viral load within aerosols within our practices. And that's going to cost us to do that. And are we going to get help with that to do it? Are we going to have to refit our practices in other ways? Are we going to have to invest and use enhanced PPE and learn how to use it properly and learn how to don it and doff it properly? Are we going to afford, be able to afford to do that? especially we have, if we have a reduced range of treatments that we can provide wearing that PPE. So for example, if we're using we're endodontists and we're using microscopes, but we can't use the new PPE with a microscope, well, what do we do? Or what if we use loops routinely and we can't use our loops? What do we do? Can we actually remain dentists if we've become absolutely reliant on our loops what we're going to do get loops that seal around our eyes how do you decontaminate the loop itself how we're going to have to get used to having reduced patient numbers in our surgeries and reduced patients in the waiting room or no waiting rooms patients coming in at appointment times uh, reduced patient throughput how we're going to have immunity passports generally in the world where we have a patient who's got to provide evidence that they've got immunity and how's that going to work? And how, how with immunity being a moving feast, what's going to be the lifespan of that passport? It's not going to be a 10-year one like the current passport, is it? You know, or actually, will it be none of this? And we need to be aware of that, that that's a real possibility as well. That we, don't, we won't have to make all these changes. And you may be angry at me for saying that, but it's actually a poss possibility. So what if dentists don't show an excess infection rate? Does that mean that we're wrong about aerosols? You know, does it, is it multiple other confounding factors? Is it the fact that dentists are solitary beasts and we don't have as wide a circle of friends as other people? Perhaps we social isolate or people social isolate from us and I'm being a bit facetious there. But do we know? Did our universal precautions mitigate adequately in the first place? before this if and should we go back to what we did before so what do our patients want us to do i think our patients want us as they always did they want us to provide a safe environment for them that's what our patients want they want us to use scientific evidence-based practice and, and where it's available they want us to use an evidence-based approach to give them treatment that's going to work be predictable be effective be long-lasting they don't want us to use silly treatments that have got no evidence base behind them just because we like the sound of them they don't want us to profiteer either generally in our dentistry or regarding this crisis. They don't want practices opening saying we're safer than the guy down the road when it's not true and when it's used as a profiteering exercise. We want us to be effective team players both in our practices but also in the world of dentistry. They want to 
they want dentistry to be seen as a an example of a, a group of experts that are regarded highly in the UK as an effective, efficient team of scientifically trained people. And therefore, I think we, we should try to be a positive force within this incredible civilization, civilizational change that's happening at the moment. And I have to ask you, is it too much to ask for us to do this now? This is a once in a lifetime event for us all. So we have a lot to do. We're not doctors in some ways, but we're professionals. We're experts. We all have a duty to be a force for change within our own profession at the moment. And we need to take that control. We, we want a dentist led regulation, wet fingered dentists who know about being a dentist regulating us. We are experts and we are professionals and we can self-regulate. We want dentist-led merit-based leaders that we have trust in to lead us as well as they can. So thank you very much for listening to me this morning. I uh, appreciate it very much. I hope I haven't completely driven you to drink with this presentation, um, but I'd be delighted to answer any of your questions and uh, uh, the final slide will just give you some more information about some more very, very interesting, pro well, <laughs> not more ones, but some interesting pro, C pro dental CPD webinars that are coming up shortly. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, Dom, absolutely amazing, mate. I'm so glad we managed to persuade you to do this. It was stunning. It was absolutely stunning. Much. I think it was one of the best webinars I've seen. It was informative, knowledgeable. Uh, confrontational certainly made me think uh, and the feedback has been great it's so good uh, there's a few questions that have come through that I kind of didn't really fit in at the time so I just want to uh, run them by you now Absolutely. Um, yeah. one partic particularly from Loren here uh, about the role of the dental hygienist what do you think yeah. is going to happen with them long term and short term well I think that's a very interesting point. I think if anything, the dental hygienist, the dental therapist is, is subject to a, a different and very, very more pronounced amount of aerosolization that's coming from that mixed aerosol I talked about. So that combination of clean water aerosol from the three, from the actual equipment they're using combined with the oral secretions and the oral secretions are you know, you've got your respiratory secretions ending up in your mouth. You've got your saliva. You've got your gingival cravicular fluid that nobody's really done testing on to see what viral load that has. And you've also got blood. So, and the blood doesn't appear to have a massive viral load in patients that are well enough to come to the dentist. If they've got a high viral load in the blood, they're normally in ICU. So how does that specifically affect dental hygienists? I think that if you actually did quantification of the amount of aerosol that they're exposed to during the course of a day, it's probably higher than dentists. I think also they can often be in smaller rooms than dentists. That, you know, that, that's a bit me just judging and guessing. Um, you know, some hygienists are working, uh, many are working with a nurse, some are not, and they've got to do that uh, change around procedure themselves as well. So I think it really has got very, very significant effects, but it comes back to again, do we actually, are we able to quantify the risk of these aerosol things at the moment? And I'm not sure we are. And, what, and where, where it's really important to me is that we're actually, we're looking at have dentists, have DCPs, have dental hygienists, got an increased rate of infection have got an increased rate, rate of morbidity and unfortunately an increased rate of mortality from this virus than the general population. And if they have, that would fit in with the hypothesis that we are seeing patients close up and personal, near the nose, near the mouth, subject to aerosols on a daily basis. But if we haven't, that raises issues as to whether the aerosol risk is, is as real as we think it is. I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Don. That's great. One from Mark Willings here. We, all the mates are in here. Okay. Uh, Hi, Mark. What's the advice RE IV preferred? Seem to be very contradictory whether it exacerbates COVID problems. Right. Well, I think that this is a complex one, uh, and I'm not 
strictly qualified to answer this question. My understanding of this is that it's subject, it's, it's something to do with non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs, and, and it's what it says on the tin. So I think the first thing is it's an anti-inflammatory medication. Therefore, it has effects on certain parts of the immune response. And you could argue that that has a positive effect if somebody's got cytokine storm and they've got a massively aberrant immune response and they're facing death from COVID-19 with the lungs filling up with fluid. But you could also argue that because your virus in the early days of infection has been shown to dampen down your innate immunity then the very last thing you want to be doing at that time is taking something that also it dampens down your immunity as well such as a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug now that being said we've also got the the other side of the coin which is that people are taking these for chronic conditions and that's where i think i've got to hold my hand up and say it's not appropriate for me to give that advice i think that uh, patients should liaise with the doctors i think the patients are taking this for for serious conditions and i think that at the moment i think the jury's still out on it and i'm afraid there's no consensus on it at the moment and that counts for other things such as ace inhibitors as well so we're at the early stages of knowledge about this and about what happens with therapeutics just to a, a brief thing that what, what's very interesting is that there's a study come through now that shows that patients who've actually already got fairly serious lung problems, but they're on a certain types of medication for it, are underpopulated in seriously ill COVID-19 patients. And I'll try and provide that for you later today as well, Rob. And that study tends to be alluding to the fact that some of the medications they're taking could be protecting them from COVID-19. So there's some, it's, it's really complicated. So the answer to you, Mark, is um, I'll get you some papers on it, mate, but it's, there's no easy answer. Thank you. Okay. A few more questions coming in. Um, one from uh, Mike Ainsworth, <laughs> the mate. Oh, Great presentation. Hi, Mike. <laughs> You're going to give a prediction, Dom. Uh, when do you think we might start to see a lifting of the prohibition of dental services? When are we going to get back to normal, do you think? Um, difficult to say. I think that, as, as I alluded to in the talk, I think we're going to have a, a more targeted approach to a reduction in the uh, than the lockdown and uh, measures. So I think we're going to find that we're going to have secondary surge sites within the UK. So the London primary surge site, and then we've got surges happening in Sheffield. We've got surges in Liverpool. We've got surges in other places. We've got the opposite of that. So we've got places like Hull, which have got very low numbers of virus we've got the southwest where there's a very low number of cases at the moment uh, and we also don't have any quantification as to the number of patients who are walking around who've had it and have never had any symptoms yeah. just going off the point for a second we've got the government at the moment doing antibody antibody testing so the testing nine companies that have provided something called a, a home-based self-test for antibodies and that's where you could buy it from boots buy it from amazon get it delivered to your house do a pin prick on your finger test your blood 20 minutes later it tells you whether you've got antibodies to the covid19 virus or not now what's interesting about that is they're doing that the government are testing the tests and they're testing them against the gold standard tests which are held in port and down now port and down is the place where the biological weapon weaponry is is basically developed uh, or was developed but it's also the, the real center of very very advanced biomedical science in the uk and their test is extremely sensitive and extremely specific and has got a 98.9% .9 sensitivity rate. It's a very accurate test. Unfortunately, some of the tests that they're doing for the home test, uh, four out of five of them are inaccurate. So you do 100 tests, 80 of them are inaccurate results. And that's worse than not having a test. So the worry with the the testing for antibodies to give us an idea and understanding of how many patients and how many of our fellows are walking around immune have had the virus we don't know and so i think that dental services part of it is going to relate 
to that wider testing of the general population to understand what the level of innate immunity is in the population at this time, what the level of people who've already had the virus is and what that means with regard to modelling of the likelihood of having a secondary pandemic, particularly over the winter months when medicines are already stretched with other things. So I think it depends on that. Now to try and give you a bit more flavour on that, I think the government are going to be reviewing this before the end of April. I think we're going to start getting an understanding of when the surge happens. Is it going to still be Easter Sunday? My own feeling is we're going to have increased number of deaths, unfortunately, for a few days after that. But then we're going to start to see a decline in cases and in deaths. We're going to start understanding what our curve's going to look like. At that stage, we're going to then start making predictions on how low the new number of infections needs to be on a daily basis for us to be able to relax measures. And that's probably not going to be countrywide or UK wide. That's going to happen in specific areas and that's going to affect dentistry. So, for example, it could be the case that we have wide provision of dentistry opens again in Hull, but definitely doesn't open in Sheffield. And that's very complicated. And that's going to further put strain on our dental leaders to say the least but anyway i hope mike that's given you a flavor but you know i'd be thinking may time we're going to have a much better understanding of that i know personally i think i'm going to be starting doing dentistry again sometime in may but i'm an optimistic type despite not appearing to be optimistic some of the time but i am really so i'm thinking may time i'm not thinking august september at the moment but that could very much change Cheers, yeah, mate. I'd, I'd, I'd agree with you. Great question. So I'd agree with you, Dom. I think we're going to be looking probably late May before we get some sort of clinical work being done. I don't know what that's going to be. I don't think anybody knows quite what, how that's going to be and what, what sort of what it's going to look like. Uh, just yeah. a couple of other questions here uh, from Diana here, uh, looking uh, talking about the slow hand piece. So is yeah. the slow hand piece much safer than the fast hand piece for emergency treatment? And is it safe to use? Well, it depends. I think this, again, it's uh, my technical knowledge of this is limited, but if your slow hand piece hasn't got water spray, you've got other issues. So therefore you're using your slow hand piece to do traditionally high speed hand piece procedures, such as trying to open a tooth up that's got amalgam in it. You've got to ask yourself, well, you're actually what you're doing there if you're not using the water cooling. You're actually creating a lot of heat there. And heat has been shown if you're cutting amalgam with it, you're going to create a lot of methyl mercury there. Methyl mercury is a toxin and you're going to be breathing that in instead. And that's recognised to cause serious uh, neurological effects at a high enough dose. So that, for example, is an area where you've got to look at other issues. You've also got the fact that you're going to have blood splatter. If you haven't got an effective irrigation coming from your handpiece, you're going to have that rose head burst spinning around 5,000 times a minute, splattering blood at left, right and centre. You're going to have to look at the morbidity to the patient. So you're doing a procedure that may have taken three or four minutes with a high speed and good irrigation but may take 25 minutes with a slow speed. So you therefore, you're in front of the patient for five times longer and the patient's in front of you for five times longer. And you've got to think then, well, are you actually quantifying the risk of how long you're exposed to that patient? Imagine if you've got the virus, you're giving that patient five times more face time with you just because you think, well, all right, I'm not using a high speed, I'm using a slow speed instead. So therefore, I don't think it's a simple answer. I think it's, you know, uh, speed increasing hand pieces that don't use a, you know, is that, is that a, I don't know. My answer is I think that it's all, a, it's all a very, very complicated. I think that we need an answer on a little bit more on quantification of aerosol risk so that we can have a little bit more of an understanding on whether we need to do it or not. And I think also we have to be very aware that if we are going to do it, we need to be aware of the other risks that we can generate by doing it. So again, looking at cutting amalgam, looking at the amount of time we're in front of the patient, looking about blood splatter and looking about patient comfort. And also, you know, for example, if we've got an anxious patient trying to cut through a tooth to create access or do something like that on a patient who's already got dental anxiety if you're using a slow speed that's going to make it 10 times worse i know me for example i'm not dentally anxious but i bloody hate it when they use the slow speed <laughs> it feels like my whole head's rattling so you know that's my views on that anyway thank you
Okay, uh, I think we're pretty much uh, toward the end of the questions, really. Um, somebody mentioned here about using a solution of hydrogen peroxide in the clean water. Yeah, well, I think that's very interesting. Hydrogen peroxide has been shown to be uh, effective in killing the virus. Uh, it depends on the, the level of it, though. So, um, you know, if you've got a 0.01% hydrogen peroxide uh, level in your water, I'm not sure that has the same effect as if you've got a 3%. And then when you've got a higher level of hydrogen peroxide in your clean water system, what's it doing to your clean water system? So what's it doing to the patency of your, uh, of your tubing? What's it doing to areas where it's actually stored in the bottle? What's it doing to the metal within your hand pieces? What's it doing to all these things? And what's it doing with regard to creating rough surfaces inside there that could create a more of a, a storage site for biofilm, for example? We don't know that. So therefore, again, it's one of those things where on the surface, top line, you think, oh, that's a good idea. And it probably is a good idea. But it isn't a good idea if it deteriorates your hand pieces in two weeks and causes other problems with biofilm collection within the actual tube into the hand pieces. So you end up with rough tubing that's full of biofilm. So for me, again, it's one way you need further advanced scientific analysis of these things to understand what the benefits and what the uh, deficits of them are first um, before it's just rolled out as a as a something that... It's a bit like bagging your instruments, which is, uh, you know, rubbish, but we all do it. All right. Okay. There's a few people who have asked questions. I mean, the, the, the feedback has been phenomenal, Don. Absolutely brilliant. Everybody said how much they enjoyed it. Best webinar they've seen, I would agree. Been stunning. Oh, thank you very much. Stunning, mate. Um, we have recorded this. Uh, we will make that available uh, again free. Uh, it'll probably be next week by the time that's all done. Got so many webinars to go through and edit down um but that will be available it'll be free uh we we will send you an email automatically probably the next five days uh just because we've got so much to do with other stuff at the moment and that will have a link for everybody for their feedback forms and cpd certificates we'll i'll we'll liaise with dom afterwards as well and we'll get a couple of these references to get links to the facebook groups I talked about uh, so we'll put all that into the email as well. So you kind of got links for everything. It's a rapidly changing thing. None of us really know what's going to happen in the next month. Uh, some people are asking about urgent dental centers. Um, things are happening in the background because nothing's happening nationally. Uh, but I think things will change in the next week or two with, with regard to that. We have, I know it will because I, think, I know things are happening. Uh, but again, Dom, thank you. Absolutely stunning, mate. Uh, I'm going to draw the meeting to a close. Uh, please join up, follow us on, our, on Facebook or go onto our website. We've got this, these webinars are carrying on now. We're booked in th through until virtually the end of May already. Uh, we've been blown away by the response and by the people who've given up their time for free. We're, there's no charge for anybody for this. Nobody's taking anything for it. Uh, it's been brilliant. Okay. Thank you so much. Cheers, Dom. Cheers, all mates. Okay. Bye now. Take care. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.